Okay, Christina, we're going. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Good to have you on. Uh, excited to to talk to you and, and meet you. Um, and I mean, you're you're the person who created the the world's first talking dog, I guess. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's so yeah, cool. It still seems surreal. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so crazy. Um, well, let's. So I've read your book. Let's mention your book just right off from the start. Um, it's called "How Stella Learned to Talk: The Groundbreaking Story of the World's First Talking Dog," which is awesome. Such a good title. Uh, it's it's you know it sounds great. We found you on Instagram initially, but I guess for people that have, are just hearing the title and they're not familiar, um, why don't? Well, maybe should we have them pause and and go and watch a video of yours? <laughs> That's the best way to learn <laughs> what's going on with Stella for sure. But I can um, give a little rundown of of what I did with Stella and and what it means when I say that I taught her to talk. If that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Let's. That'd be great. Let's do that. Perfect. So I'm a speech language pathologist by trade, and I I worked with a lot of children who are nonverbal and use communication devices to talk. Um, this happens a lot with different disabilities and disorders that impact kids' ability to talk um, with their verbal speech. And so when that happens, it's my job to find a different way for kids to talk because verbal speech and language are totally different. they are different capabilities, different skill sets. So if someone isn't able to talk, I have to find a device or another method for them to be able to say words. So at the same time that I was working in this space, I brought home my puppy, Stella, um, my boyfriend and I had just moved in together and we were super excited. But as soon as I brought Stella home, I realized that she shared a lot of the same developmental skills as kids do when they're learning to talk. And I wondered if dogs can understand words, what if they had a different way to say words that's not verbal speech? So I got these buttons and recorded them um, to say different words or program them to say different words and started teaching Stella in the same ways that I would teach children to use words and ended up creating this device where Stella can say now a ton of different words and express her, her different thoughts and needs to me. Yeah. So, and, and so it's the, the best way I think to describe the button is it, it is like one of those staples, uh, easy buttons, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. So I started out with just a few of those with, and I programmed some really simple words like outside, play, and water. And now we've grown to Stella is using about 50 different words. And she combines words together to create these unique phrases and, and really participate in short, simple conversations with me. Yeah, oh, it's so crazy. What, what, <laughs> what I think is kind of uh, unique about you is, you know, there's, we've all kind of learned about like Coco the gorilla and everything and, mm -hmm. you know, different animals who have, there's been this kind of stuff that they've learned to talk or communicate better mm -hmm. in different ways. But I feel like you're unique because you're not coming at it from like a, uh, an animal background. You're coming at it from a, like a language communication background. Right. Absolutely. I've always felt that, and by always, I mean the past like three years, but I've really felt that that background allowed me to realize this ability in dogs because I think if I came from a dog background, there's a lot of, I don't know, it's not, you know, a common knowledge that dogs have this capability to learn to say words because you have to look at it through the right lens. And so I saw kind of this combination of all of these milestones that happen with kids and all of the ways that toddlers express language that aren't words and then dogs are doing the same thing and just merge these two fields together. So I feel like that experience in my my language background was really, you know, the foundation of all of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's so cool. You had like the the perfect credentials, and then to to kind of see those developmental uh, similarities, I guess, and then piece it together. And and you were literally just like, well, let's try it. Let's give Stella some buttons and she see if she can start to do it. And you know, how, I guess how long was it until she, um, from when you kind of had that idea and maybe threw the buttons on the ground, did she actually start to use them? It took about a month. So 
I brought her home when she was eight weeks old. She was super young. And I had this idea immediately. I ordered the first box of buttons like four days after (laughs) bringing her home. So I was just super curious to see what would happen. I wanted to try it out. I had researched this because when the idea popped in my head, I, I just kept thinking someone has had to have done this. Like if it's occurring to me, it's had to have occurred to other people. There's gotta be all this stuff out there. And when there wasn't, I decided to just try for myself and, and see what would happen. But it took about a month of me just modeling her words in our natural context. So anytime you know we went outside or we had just come back from outside, I would say outside verbally and press her outside button several times. I used the same strategies that I would use with kids to kind of facilitate their language development. Um, anytime Stella was playing, I was just narrating what she was doing by saying play and pushing her play button. Same with when she was getting water. Anytime she was already taking a drink or I was filling up her bowl, I was saying water and, and pushing water so that she was seeing how she could say that word if she also wanted to. Right. And so is that the same or a similar process that, that you would do with a, a human? Yeah, absolutely. So if there's a child um, that I work with who is using a communication device and learning how to use a communication device for the first time, the best thing to do is just for all of the adults and even their siblings around them to use their device to talk as well, because they have to learn that this is a shared language and what each word and each symbol means on the device. So in my therapy sessions, I would be you know, speaking with my verbal speech and then also using their device to say those same words because they're hearing the words that I'm saying and then seeing how they can say them too. So it takes a lot a lot of time to do this with kids. I mean, sometimes it can take months or even years before kids start using their device on their own. Because if you think about like a a typical human baby hears an entire year's worth of speech before they start talking. So you have to have time to really hear the words that are being said in your environment around you and develop the the receptive language skills before um, kids are able to use the words on their own. So it takes a while. It didn't take that long with Stella. It wasn't years, <laughs> but I was actually pretty impressed that it only took a month before before she started using words on her own. It seemed like forever when I was going through it, but then in hindsight, I was like, wow, that's actually you know, pretty impressive that in just a month, she was able to develop these brand new skills to her. Mm-hmm. And, well, and the, um, I mean, yeah, a month you're like, Hearing it now in retrospect, it sounds so quick, but, uh, right. you know, as you're going through it, you in the book, you're talking about, you know, how it's, it's demotivating. Like you don't know if she's even like understanding what you're doing or she's, mm-hmm. she's even looking at the buttons while you're doing it. Um, but you had what I think your advantage was, well, kind of like we said with your, with your uh, being a speech language pathologist was that you knew kind of the small signs to look for that she was mm-hmm. starting to see that the buttons were, were working right where she was. And that's kind of something that you kind of help people with and share in your book. And and if someone wants to do this is to, to um, notice those small things and uh, take those little things that like, Oh, she's just looking at the button when you use it, like that's a big deal. And it means it's starting exactly. to work. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That is huge for this. Like that was my job as a speech therapist was to to find what was working and to build on it and to let other people know too because parents and other professionals don't know if if something's going well unless they hear their child talking with their device. But there's a lot of stuff that happens before that that shows us if we're moving in the right direction. So, yeah, that was a perfect example like about a week before Stella started using uh, words for the first time, she just started looking down at the button. And that doesn't sound exciting, but I was so freaking excited to see her just look at the button and look up at me because for two weeks, she hadn't done that at all. It was just me pushing the buttons and it didn't seem like she even knew what I was doing or was watching me at all. But then she started looking down at the button and looking up at me she started just walking past the buttons, like back and forth. She started barking at them. She started just like 
pawing <laughs> and she was so far off. She was like a half a foot away from the button, but she was like trying to press it. So I saw all of those yeah, little signs and I knew that we were heading in the right direction and got really excited when I saw that happen. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you talked about how you would use like kind of when you're modeling these words, you would say like outside and then press the outside button. So so the idea with that is showing that, um, I guess saying that you could, you would say the word outside and then Stella could hear that and, and understand it, but then show that her way of saying outside to you is by pressing that button, right? Exactly. So it's just showing, you know, I'm saying the word, she's hearing it and I'm saying it at the right time. Like when we're going outside, not just randomly throughout the day. And then I'm also pressing her outside button, which says outside when you press it so that she's hearing this is the same word and this is how, you know, and seeing that she can say it in that way too, if she wants. So it's very naturalistic. Um, you know, I didn't use treats at all to reinforce her pushing a button. I didn't give her a command to like say a word. I just truly gave her the opportunity to use words if that was something that she wanted to do. And that's what I think is most surprising to people about this. It, it wasn't this like stimulus response, do this. And Stella, you know, says a word. It was, it was very naturalistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that was something that I was kind of shocked. I would, I would think that, um, you know, me not understanding how language works and everything and having, you know, been through a bit of training with my dog, I would, I was surprised that you never like literally took her paw and pressed it down for her. I was mm -hmm. like, how is she ever going to know that she could even push it? But you, you didn't do that at all because you, it would be like putting words in her mouth, right? Exactly. Cause if you think about it, you can't physically pull words out of someone's mouth who's talking with verbal speech. And so that's not how we would teach a child to talk because you, obviously you can't force someone to say something. And so we want to give the same respect to people who are using devices to communicate to and, and allow them to go through all the same milestones that kids who are communicating with verbal speech go through. And that's, you know, something that's a big skill that goes along with that is imitation. So kids learn to talk through imitation. They hear us saying words, they try to make the sounds, they see their parents making sounds and words, and they try to say them back. Uh, they imitate, you know, clapping and waving gestures, all kinds of things. And dogs are able to imitate us too. So that was one of, you know, the biggest like flags for me of, you know, maybe Stella would be able to use words because she, dogs imitate humans gestures and understand humans gestures so at you know in the initial stages of this she was imitating me when I was pushing a button then she would go over and push the button and then she learned to do it on her own you know without my cueing or anything mm -hmm. yeah well and that's what's so I feel like some of the criticisms of um you know like Coco or or other animals who have learned to to speak like this is that it's you know they're like oh well the trainers are giving them subtle cues or there's mm -hmm. you know it's they've just learned to push this and then they get a reward or something but right. again I think because you are not a dog trainer you're you're you know specializing in speech you went about it the correct way where I don't think any of that could be said about this about you and Stella exactly and that's something I think yeah, that's often the first thought that people have. And then once they start watching videos or read the book, it just all of that goes away because it wasn't even the same process at all. And, you know, Stella uses her words when we're not in the same room. It's not just with us. If she's with family or friends or a dog sitter, she's able to communicate in the same way. And, and we're not giving her those directions of what to say when. And by not doing that, we've actually it's just been incredible to see all that she talks about. And I, I talk about this a lot in my book, but by not giving her commands of like, say this or say that at a certain time, you really give her the opportunity to say what's on her mind and to communicate for herself. And that has been far more rewarding to see what she's actually thinking about and hear her actual thoughts instead of just say this, because I think you should be saying this right now. Cause that's, that's not how any of us communicate. Mm -hmm. We're we're just sharing what's on our mind. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. So, and I mean, the fact that she, she communicates with other people when you have a dog sitter and stuff like that, I think is so big and so just so huge. But, and I, I was reading kind of in researching for this, I was reading, um, some guy was criticizing this. He's like, you know, if, if this really is working, then it has to be, you know, that we have to have Stella communicate something and then show it to a bunch of different people and they all have to interpret it exactly the same way. But I'm mm-hmm. like, even if you get, like, if you gave a human 50 buttons, 50 words to talk with, and they're trying to communicate a thought, like there would be so much, uh, you know, misinterpretation oh. of that stuff. So it's so unfair. Yeah. And that's something that I think is just another big misconception and where having a background in language development really comes in in handy. So if a toddler says ball, what do they mean? Do they want the ball? Are they showing their mom the ball? Are they talking about the ball that they saw yesterday at the store? Are they wanting to play basketball? Do they want to go find the soccer ball? Like you have no idea, but that's completely normal because that's a normal stage in language development. We're just, adults are so used to our typical adult language that's complex, but there are stages of language development that come before this. And it's, I think that's what a lot of people just don't realize because they wouldn't have a reason to think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I want to, Okay. Yeah. I want to talk about how Stella started forming, you know, putting words together and everything is kind of forming more complex thoughts, but let's kind of go back to the story and the timeline a bit. So she's, you initially give her, um, how many words did you initially give her? I started with three, three different buttons. Okay. And then, so I guess kind of just for people listening, talk, walk us through kind of the process of, of, um, you know, when she started to learn those and then how you started to add on buttons and and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I stuck with the first three for a little while because I didn't know if this would even work or anything like that. So I started with three simple words outside play and water because they were things that Stella was doing every day throughout the day. We were going outside, she was playing, she would drink water Um, they were concepts she was already communicating about. So I talk about that a lot in my book of, of picking words that correspond to the gestures she's already showing or how she's already, um, communicating. So once she, about a month in, when she started using outside a couple days later, she started using clay and water. And I waited a little while before adding more words until I started using, or I started seeing Stella use words in different ways. So when I first started this out, I thought maybe Stella would just have words to clarify her needs to, it would just be easier if, if she had some basic needs that she could talk about. But I didn't think that she would use words in other ways besides requesting. So for example, I shared the story in my book, but I was watering my plants one day and Stella was right next to me trotting along and she sniffed the watering can, went down the hall into another room and said water and then came right back. So that was the first time she used water, not to let me know that her bowl was empty and she needed more water, but she was just pointing out what was in her environment and what was happening. And so things like this kept happening and I started yeah, thinking, okay, if she's using words for other functions than just requesting, then I've really got to add some more vocabulary here. So a few months later, I added words like walk, that was a big word for her, um, buy, come, help, know, and love you. I think that was the whole next batch. Oh, and eats. I added eat at that point. And so I kept modeling um, those words throughout the day. She she picked them. Um, mm, I think within like a few weeks, she started using all of those words on her own. And at this point, I kept all of the buttons like spread around our house. So outside was by the door, play was by her toys. I had a line of buttons just kind of against the wall in our living room. But then when she had about 11 different words, um, one night we were, (laughs) we had just come back from the beach and she hadn't eaten dinner yet. And Stella walked over and said, eat, and then walked into the other room and said, no. And that was the first time she put two words together to let me know that she hadn't eaten dinner yet. So 
from then is when I really saw like, there's a lot of potential here. You know, she's starting to combine words now. She's making phrases with unique messages. And so that led me to um, put her words together on a board. And then I just continuously added more vocabulary as she learned different words and concepts. And we're now on like our third board. We had to keep growing in size because we just kept adding more and more words. So in total, it's been, it was about three years of doing this, but it was, you know, this gradual process of adding words along the way. Mm -hmm. And so the, I guess the concept behind initially put all the buttons in in different areas because you put, you know, the water button by her water. So you Mm -hmm. thinking it would help her kind of understand that. But then once you saw her starting to put words together, then you're like, okay, let's put all these in one central spot so she can really start combining them. Yeah. So at first, yeah, I thought it'd be easier if the words were in their location and when she would use them. And then when I saw that she had to go from room to room (laughs) to actually put words together, because I really didn't know that would even be a skill she would develop. But when she did, I realized I had just made it a lot harder for her to do that. Because imagine having to walk into a different room or a different part of your house to just say a complete thought. It would be, you know, it would take a while. It'd be pretty labor intensive to do that. So I was curious if putting them all together um, would make it easier for her to learn, or I, I really didn't know if it would totally just throw everything out the window that we had just done, or if it would propel her forward. And it was really exciting to see that when she learned her new setup, it completely propelled her forward. That's when she really started talking all the time. She was combining words every day, making new phrases. And it was just like this world opened up for her that she could like create her own little short sentences, combine words together and use those word combinations every day consistently. Mm -hmm. So are you, um, Are you still kind of at the point, I mean, maybe for new words, but like for words that she's really familiar with, are you still um, consistently like pressing those buttons yourself or are you just saying them to her? So when I talk with Stella, I either just reduce the complexity of my language. So I'll talk in pretty in short, simple phrases, you know, Stella, come outside, Stella, Christina, walk now, phrases that are at her level of understanding I do use her board sometimes when I'm talking with her just to continue to reinforce it. So as I say a word verbally, I'll also say it um, with her board, but it's not as important now that she has, has really learned where all of her words are and is able to use them all independently. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I think is also impressive is, you know, when you see the board, it's, it's just a, it's a huge board with, I mean, how many buttons are on there now? Oh, uh, she has about 50 now. 50, 50 buttons. So buttons. like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking like, man, me, even as like a, hopefully a fully developed human, well, I don't know, I guess, but mm-hmm. uh, hopefully like, I'm like, it would be so hard for me to memorize 50 buttons. Like I can barely mm-hmm. remember, you know, the keys on a keyboard, but mm-hmm. that's really what Stella has been able to do. Right. Yeah. It, it is very, very impressive. And I, I watch her walking patterns and see, like she has these routes that she takes and just goes so fast, like through her buttons and is able to reach her paw across with just such impressive, like, I don't even know. It, it is very impressive to watch, but you'd be surprised with the level of modeling that we do and, and me using her her buttons to talk to her. Like my, I use my foot normally when I'm modeling and my foot just kind of knows where to go once I've, I've used those words quite a few times. So sometimes I'll test myself. I'll go up and close my eyes (laughs) and try to see if I can say what I was hoping to say and and see how off I was. But it is really Mm -hmm. interesting to see if you really try um, and practice this you know, what our bodies can do, our brains and bodies can learn. Mm -hmm. And then two, also something that kind of 
struck me, I guess, reading this and, and just, I have a dog too. And, you know, seeing her around and seeing kind of what she's trying, I'm like, oh, what is she trying to say here? What she trying, mm-hmm. what does she need from us? Um, do you feel that having, cause you've had dogs in the past that, you know, didn't have a button, didn't mm-hmm. have a board to talk. Um, have you, do you think your kind of relationship or an understanding with Stella has been deepened by ha- like kind of having a shared language where you guys can communicate a lot better? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's pretty wild to think about. I, you know, I was really close with our family dog growing up Wrigley. She was a boxer. She was so sweet. She was very, very communicative. Um, you know, she was always standing in front of us whining. We would kind of cycle through. Do you want to go outside? Do you want to play? Do you want to treat? And if it wasn't one of those things, you know, she would still stand there and whine and we had no idea why. And now I think back and I'm just like, wow, you know, what was she trying to tell us? Was she thinking about our grandparents' dog who would come over or was she missing one of my sisters or, you know, what was it? But even just thinking about Stella, like when I first started out teaching her, I look back at videos and see how frustrated she was. You know, she was whining so much more and I didn't know what she wanted. I didn't know what she was trying to say. And so having that ability to know what she needs, to understand what's important to her, what she's thinking about, I feel like I I truly know a lot of what's going on in her mind and and can care for her better because I understand her needs and and can serve those better for her. So I think it's, I I can't even really comprehend it sometimes how, how much it's changed our relationship, but it's very special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what's so cool about it. And I, I think so many times with, with our dog Murphy of, of how like she's just afraid of something that's, you know, just going in the car or something like that. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I wish we could just communicate with her and let her know that it's Mm -hmm. nothing. It's all cool. It's fine. Nothing to be afraid of. And it, it would just make her so much more, so much less stress for her. I think if we could Mm -hmm. really get, you know, if we could do what you've done. (laughs) That's something I've, I've noticed too with Stella, just, I think I talk about this in my book, just when Stella knows what's happening, she's so much less anxious. That sounds really simple. Like, obviously, if she knows what's happening, she's going to be less anxious. But I think about all the times that we would just bring her in the car and she had had no idea where we were going or what we were doing. And when I just tell her, you know, we're going in the car, we're going to the park or going in the car, going for a walk, she's able to settle down so much more because she knows what to expect, you know, for what's happening next. And I think just helping you know, having this shared language and and realizing that dogs can understand words and have the ability to use words back just allows us to connect with them on such a deeper level and, and help them feel safer and secure and, and know what's going on in their environment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, something that we kind of always like, you know, years ago before you started, we knew about you and what you're doing and everything. Mm-hmm. We would kind of joke like, man, wouldn't it be great if, if Murphy could talk and we could talk to her and then we'd be <laughs> thinking about it. We'd be like, nah, maybe not. She'd just kind of annoy us all day and ask to play and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, but then you even, cause I think that was, that's probably a concern people have is like, you know, mm-hmm. if I give my dog a, a play button or an eat button, are they just going to mm-hmm. be hitting that thing all day? And, you know, bugging the crap (laughs) out of us. Yep. That's definitely something that people say a lot. And (laughs) interestingly, I've, I heard this a lot as a speech therapist too, which is really hard to believe, but you'd be surprised. There were a lot of times when I would, you know, introduce a device to a child or a, a kid would start using their device more independently. And just like any other toddler using verbal speech that he would say his favorite words all the time on his device. And the parents sometimes or professionals would delete that word or they would take the device away. And I had to have so many conversations and say, you know, this would be like the equivalent of duct taping a child's 
mouth shut. Like you, you can't just remove their device just because they're saying what they're thinking about all the time. And so it's just been interesting hearing the same kinds of concepts. Like, I don't want my dog to have this word because then they'll say it all the time. But from my perspective, I would much rather know what they're thinking about all the time than just have them whining like crazy and not know why. So I think, um, it's just been interesting seeing those parallels of, I would, I would hear that a lot in speech therapy, unfortunately. And now, yeah, some people are hesitant <laughs> to give their dogs those, you know, highly preferred words. Cause they, they don't want to hear, hear them saying it all the time. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, um, I think, yeah, when, when this kind of stuff happens, or I guess as you kind of teach your dog to, to speak, or even with, you know, a child or something, it's, mm-hmm. um, it's cruel. Like I wouldn't even think about it, but it, it would be so cruel to take, you know, a word away from them or something like that. It's, it's like duct taping their mouth shut. So I think doing this with your, with your dog, you know, would, would mm-hmm. really help you just tr- you know, just to treat them better. Like you're not mm-hmm. there. I mean, I don't know. People think different, I guess, about dogs, but to me, and I, I'm sure you with Stella, like our dog is like a member of the family. We would want to mm-hmm. like treat them well and have Murphy be able to, you know, communicate to us. And, and so mm-hmm. I think this is just a way, like when you said that, I was like, yeah, that would be horrible. I would never want to duct tape Murphy's mouth shut, but it, it just kind right. of trains the, but the dog owners thinking a little bit to be like, let's address the dog's needs here and what, what they actually need rather than just like, you know, behaviorally shutting them down or something. I don't know. Exactly. It's so common and so easy to just treat the behavior rather than what's lying underneath it. So really thinking about why something's happening or what they're trying to communicate and reaching that level instead of just you know, the surface level behavior that you're seeing. And I think something too, which this is fair, like people just don't realize it because this is so new, but you don't have to say yes every time (laughs) to your dog requesting something. So, I mean, Stella has learned some boundaries just by, you know, these real life situations where if she's asking for something over and over and, and we're not able to go, like, I'll have to say no or later, or we're all done. And eventually she understands that. And then she stops asking for it and we'll, we'll go do something else. So I think people, you know, just assume that you have to say yes all the time to keep reinforcing it, but you can still reinforce the meaning of a word by using it in another context. So I can say no park now park later, and then go to the park later. And that's okay. So I think you know, just reminding people that just because they're asking for something all the time, you're not, you know, like indebted to them (laughs) to to say yes every single time, just like you would teach a child some boundaries too. And that's, that's perfectly okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. This dog, just because your dog learns to talk, it's not going to take over your life or or become (laughs) your master, I guess. Exactly. It's like, you know, when a toddler has a cookie for the first time, they'll probably keep asking for cookies because it tasted really good, but you wouldn't necessarily give them a cookie every time you would explain we have cookies after dinner or whenever it's appropriate and then just teach them. So I think dogs can learn a lot more than people realize. And, and we just have to give them the opportunity and the right, you know, strategies and right skills to teach with. Mm -hmm. So something that I think is kind of a, I don't know, it's a theme or whatever. So that way I've kind of seen through your book and and this conversation is that how dogs are pretty remarkably similar to, you know, humans in their, in Mm -hmm. their, at least in their language and communication development. Um, Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a fair assessment that, you know, it's, you know, can we kind of compare maybe a, a, and certain age child with like a dog's brain? That's a really great question. I think, so I take a look at different like language milestones for different ages and kind of look at what Stella's done. I run her language samples for a day through, you know, software that I have that 
analyzes everything and shows different levels of development. And it's really interesting. There's skills that she demonstrates that are between like two and four years old in comparison to humans. And so I don't know if we can definitively say like an age that she's at, but I see this range of skills that she has. So I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done before, you know, we can draw those types of conclusions. But I think what I've done with Stella is just showing all the things that we need to look into more. So it's really just this door opening and this light shining on like, hey, dogs can do this. Like, let's figure this out. Let's see how far this can go. You know, let's let's answer some questions here. So I think as more and more people teach their dogs, as there's more research, hopefully we'll be able to draw some more concrete comparisons. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I I mean, it, you know, me being a dummy who doesn't know this stuff, it sounds, you know, logical, like evolutionarily wise, that's, you know, a dog's brain would be similar to ours. And, you know, they, Mm -hmm. at least they develop, I I guess they don't get as big as us homo sapiens, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it it does kind of make sense. Um, They just kind of I guess they obviously lack the ability to, you know, form words and and speak them like they don't have the, whatever the mouth. Right, different anatomy. Have yeah, (laughs) yeah, anatomy. Thank you. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's really, and that's something that piqued my interest so early on in my pursuit with Stella too. Was you know, there's all this research from recent years about dogs being able to understand words and how many words dogs can understand dogs understanding humans gestures and social cues and just other parts of language that people don't even think about so my thinking was you know if dogs are understanding all of this they should have a way to use those skills too and to to say it so that's where i think you know with humans um We have receptive language, which is our understanding, and then our expressive language, which is our output. And normally those levels are pretty equal. And so I was thinking if if dogs have all this understanding, then the expressive part should also be there too. So that was really what what drove a lot of these questions that I had. Mm -hmm. Ah, It's so fun. I love this. So I think... um... (laughs) I'm sure for me, myself, and for everybody listening, I'm sure who owns a dog, it's kind of like, well, can I do this for my dog? You know, how do mm-hmm. we, how does someone listening kind of get started or, or try it out with their, their old puppy? Yeah, absolutely. You can definitely implement this with your dog at home. Um, it's been really exciting. We've seen thousands of people who aren't speech therapists uh, teach their dogs how to use words. So it's definitely possible. Uh, my book has tons of tips, everything that we did, what worked, what didn't, and what you can take away from it. But a great place to get started is just first, before you even have buttons, is just talking to your dog in really short, simple phrases. So start narrating what your dog's doing. It might sound crazy, but <laughs> as your dog's going through his or her activities, just say what's happening. You know, I would say... <clears throat> excuse me, Stella play, Stella play toy, play now, play every time we were playing together. You know, I would, I would use our names all the time, talk about what was happening. And then when you do get buttons, you can program the same words that you already say all the time to your dog and just use the buttons as you're talking to show your dog that that's how he or she can say them too. So there's a ton of information in my book. I also have Um, the Talking Pet Starter Set, which comes with four buttons and a little um, guidebook of some different activities to get you started. So you know what to do when those buttons arrive. Nice. Yeah. I love that you have that set available just for people to get going with some tips. And yeah, I mean, we can already see with, with Murphy, it's, I mean, I guess almost inadvertently, she just knows certain words like all dogs do, Mm -hmm. you know, like she knows treat and outside and, you know, we trained her to know go pee and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, Mm that just makes sense that those were, those are the words that you would start with that we use to her. So she should be able to use back to us. Yeah, exactly. You got it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's just so fun. I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, you've 
you've done this and, you know, kind of your story is great of how you sort of naturally stumbled upon it or, or just tried it out and you had the right background mm-hmm. to really see it through, um, which is very cool. So, and then let's, uh, did you say where to get those buttons at? Oh, good question. Um, they're on Amazon. It's the Talking Pet Starter Set, walmart.com or my website, hungerforwords.com. So you can Google Talking Pet Starter Set and those will all pop up but wherever you prefer to purchase. Cool. Yeah, you're at Walmart. That's awesome. And the Talking Pet <laughs> Starter Set just rolls right off the tongue. That's nice. That's right. <laughs> um, should we send send people to your um, any social media? Because you got some good social stuff. Yeah, yeah. You can watch videos of Stella talking, get tips for teaching your own dog, and, and hear these communication stories. Um, my handle is at hunger, H-U-N-G-E-R, number four words on Instagram. YouTube and Facebook, and then my website, Hunger, H-U-N-G-E-R-F-O-R, Words, um, has a bunch of the same information and, and where you can buy my book as well, the buttons, and just learn more about our story. Cool. Yeah, and we should all have links for for people listening to click on that stuff and, and go check it out easy. And we should say, if if people listening haven't figured it out, your name is Christina Hunger, last name Hunger, <laughs> Hunger for Words. It's It worked great. It was meant to be. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you um, so cool. much. This has been so fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Christina. I, I appreciate you coming on and, and you know, teaching Stella to talk and, and sharing us how we could do the same thing. So thank you. Of course. And let me know how it goes. If any of you start teaching your dogs, send me a message, send me an email. I love to hear updates about what all these other dogs are learning. Cool. Yeah, that's good to hear. Definitely will. So thanks, Christina. Appreciate it. And uh, have a good weekend now. Yeah, thanks. You too.